Hey everybody, it is Cal Nitro for Nitro Maniac TV's Wrestling Unlimited channel coming at you with another classic Nitro's take. So thank you for clicking play and uh, spending some time. Uh, as of the time that I'm recording this, we are all in that real messy COVID-19 situation right now. And so a lot of us are staying home and uh, just recording content uh, like I am today. Uh, and uh, to do try to entertain you guys a little bit uh, it came to that time of the month as well where we typically throw open the polls and you guys vote on a classic event and I go and cover it uh, in the Nitro Steak fashion so we did the poll and the theme for March's poll for March 29 or sorry 2020 thinking a year behind not 2019 but for 2020 was a uh, great pay-per-view events that are not Wrestlemania in wrestling history and not a lot of votes this time but i can understand why because of the big worldwide issue that's happening but it was a narrow victory for wcw greed 2001 that's right the very final wcw pay-per-view uh which took place on march 18th 2001 from jacksonville florida the jacksonville memorial coliseum and another company calls jacksonville home now um you know, kind of ironic that that company is also on TNT and also on the Turner Network of networks and that stuff going forward. Um, it's It, it kind of is a cyclical thing, once every 20 years or so. So a bit of a backstory, I've never seen this pay-per-view until I reviewed it for this channel. Uh, I didn't get a chance to watch it back in the day, I know it occurred. And uh, trying to find tapes of WCW, especially during the last uh, few months of its operation, were almost uh, uh, slim to none up here in Canada. I don't know if they really came out with very much in the home video releases or anything, but I can guarantee you that none of the 2001 pay-per-views made it to home video release at all up here in Canada. Um, and a very rare amount of the 2000 stuff are pay-per-view releases from WCW seem to have stopped uh, at all the video stores at Blockbuster and everything uh, with Starcade 99 and then anything further than that uh, you know good luck trying to find it uh, you know and it's now with the WWE Network of course everything's available on that so that's a plus wish we had that back in the day but WCW's last pay-per-view takes place three days before the final episode uh, of Thunder uh, March 21st, 2001 in Gainesville, Florida, and eight days before the final Nitro in Panama City Beach, Florida. Um, I think Nitro the night after Greed on the 19th uh, was in a Florida city as well. Uh, I looked at the different sites saying that the final Thunder was in Gainesville, Florida on March 21st, 2001. So I would think that in the Jacksonville area or something, I, I don't have anything really open, but maybe post it below where the second last Monday Nitro was, maybe the last Nitro to be held in an arena. And I have written down here, it's kind of weird how WCW basically became a Florida-based promotion in its final days. Well, also very cyclical too. Because look who's running out of Florida right now. Uh, WWE's got their performance center out of Florida in Orlando. And uh, they do NXT out of Full Sail in Orlando. And AEW out of Jacksonville. And they're right now currently doing empty arena tapings in Jacksonville. So, uh, yeah, Florida just a hotbed of wrestling throughout the years. Now, this was supposed to be the third of Fusion 7 Deadly Sins themed pay-per-views. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, to take place in 2001. Uh, of course, the first one was Sin, and that was held on January 14th, 2001. They kept the Super Brawl name uh, in February, but WCW Super Brawl Revenge was on February 18th, 2001. And, of course, that was uh, the event where Sid Vicious had the unfortunate uh, career-ending leg break injury. I believe, and this was um, March 18th, 2001. Uh, however, if you believe all of the narrative that has come out over the past year or so from WWE and from Eric Bischoff and the, the you know the people that were going to be involved in the fusion deal in buying WCW, um, WCW was due to abandon the Seven Deadly Sins motive for shows and go into hiatus. After the Fusion purchase was finalized, until 
May 6, 2001, in Vegas with a big reboot pay-per-view titled uh, WCW The Big Bang. And that was going to kind of relaunch WCW as basically a Vegas-centric uh, wrestling promotion in a studio at one of the casinos and, you know, carry on from there on the Turner Network. But, of course, we know what happened, and he basically Turner execs at the time, AOL execs at the time, that just took over Time Warner in the merger, the AOL Time Warner Turner mess of 2000-2001, uh, didn't want wrestling on their networks anymore. And, of course, the final Nitro takes place in Panama City Beach, Florida, and we don't have wrestling on the Turner networks until, well, October of last year when AEW made its... Uh, triumphant debut on the Turner Networks. So let's get to the pay-per-view. We have an amazing open uh, featuring Diamond Dallas Page and Scott Steiner. That's your main event tonight for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, Tony Schiavone, right off the top, is hosting with Scott Hudson as a color man for this pay-per-view. Uh, and comments, if it's pro wrestling, then it must be greed. Uh, <laughs> ouch, kind of a, as you know, the behind the scenes inside baseball terminology there. Tony, as it has been announced and has been revealed in the past few months on his podcasts and uh, through Q&As and getting back with AEW and announcing for AEW, has said that the final days, the final basically year of WCW was absolute hell for him and uh, it didn't uh, allow him to enjoy pro wrestling much. So it's very reflective to his mindset right now, uh, you know, or back then I should say. Right now it's it's completely reinvigorated and I think the guy is having so much fun. Case in point, you know, about a week or so ago when he did the empty arena uh, commentary job with just him, Kenny Omega, and Cody Rhodes all throughout that one episode of Dynamite. Uh, for, just for dating purposes, that was, I think, March, I want to say, 23rd, 2020. Uh, you know, just let's timestamp it there. I don't have a calendar really in front of me right now, but our opening contest is Kiwi versus Jason Jett and Alan Funk. Yes, Kiwi was one of the dark horse prospects of WCW in 2000 and 2001. Kind of doing a exotic Adrian Street-esque uh, kind of, you know, gold dust almost uh, effeminate kind of a nod of adorable Adrian Adonis type character, but was absolutely over and in uh, in his heel persona became Angry Allen, and that was over with WCW fans at the time. Let me tell you, Angry Allen was money. And, uh, you know, of course, he's a member of the Funk family, and uh, just an insane amount of wrestling knowledge. Uh, again, one of the dark horse prospects of WCW in 2000 and 2001. Yeah, this would have been one of the younger guys that Fusion would have built the... Uh, WCW brand around. Definitely, if I could see like the cruiserweight and maybe the U.S. title scene around him, maybe in 2001, 2002, one of the, one of the protagonists or antagonists. Uh, he was over. Another one, Jason Jett, the former Easy Money in ECW. He had just signed with WCW about a week or two weeks before and had one match in WCW, I think the week before on Nitro against, of all people, Alex Wright in what ended up being Alex Wright's final WCW appearance and I think his final North American appearance in general. I haven't seen him really in any major promotion. Definitely didn't make it over in WWE at all, uh, you know, since then. So this was a hot opener off the start. And the match starts hot with Kiwi with the jump on Jason Jett, but Jett turns the tide with a huge crossbody. Uh, Kiwi with a hair beal at one point over the top rope on Jason Jett, so he sends Jett over the top ropes via a hair beal, and that was an ouch moment. Uh, this opener was unannounced. This was a bonus match signed the day of, and fans found out about it during the preview show that this was going to happen. And uh, this was a bring down the house dark horse match of the night. This thing is a fun watch. Uh, two count after Jets afterburner finish, which is a, basically a standing mood salt, uh, kind of similar to how RVD was doing the standing split legged mood salt off of the. The, the top, but just with a little twist to it. Uh, Jet over as the face here, and Kiwi became... He was 
heal a little bit off the beginning of the match, but as the match goes on and 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 the fight continues, uh, he is a mega heel. Uh, Jason Jett goes for a top rope power bomb, but Quibi reverses it into a Hurricane Rana from the top. Uh, an awesome handspring elbow into an elbow drop by Jason Jett. Uh, crash landing attempt, which is basically Jet's ultimate finish that used to be the moneymaker in ECW. Uh, it fails. Quibi goes for a pinfall attempt and only nails a two to count. And now for the finish, which was a little strange. Uh, Jet's playing possum in the ring after uh, Quibi goes for the two count on that uh, pinfall attempt after the crash landing uh, attempt by Jet fails. Um, I don't know why. Uh, Kiwi tries a top rope elbow and he misses and it allows Jet to hit the crash landing, which to explain it, it's, it's basically a throwaway suplex, uh, for the one, two, three, uh, an awesome opener with a weird finish, but the crowd got hot and was cheering for it. Uh, the runtime for it is 12, 17, and it's up there, uh, as the card goes on for match of the night type honors. It, it was really good. Up next, the finals for the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Title Tournament. The last new belts to be introduced in World Championship Wrestling, unfortunately, had a one-week lifespan, but they were meant to be, oh, so much more. This was, again, of uh, Bischoff and Fusion's influence in on the WCW product at the time, where they were going to focus more on younger uh the smaller junior heavyweight talent almost they could see that that trend was coming that uh you know the boom was was going to hit with uh you know the independents such as tna and ring of honor and that stuff with kind of that style of wrestling was, was starting to infiltrate a little bit and so they wanted to be on the forefront of that and these cruiserweight tag belts had the potential to do that for sure uh, basically think of if ring of honors tag team titles from say the 2003-2004 era were in line with a major promotion that's what that's the kind of wrestling quality you're getting with the wcw cruiserweight tag team title belt so anyway the matchup is on one side primetime elix skipper and kid romeo taking on kidman and Rey mysterio jr of course the former filthy animals tandem uh, Elix Skipper, one of the premier athletes in 2000 and 2001 WCW, he has split from Team Canada at this point. And Kid Romeo, again, another young cruiserweight brought in uh, for the fusion to take over WCW. But Ray and Kidman, of course, no slouches. Ray not wearing the mask at this period of time, just wearing the uh, the, the wrap gear almost. And then it's kind of the same deal with Kidman as well. Uh, Tony and Scott really putting over the youth movement of early 01 WCW. That was the direction, again, like I mentioned, that they were going. Uh, an amazing double-team guillotine leg drop by Ray. Only two uh, tandem Fred's pa uh, presses and across bodies by Ray and Kidman from the stage to Romeo and Elix Skipper as they brawled outside and fought on the aisleway at a certain point. That was a wow moment and got people just up out of their seat. And yeah, great stuff. This pace is ballistic. The crowd is super hot here. Uh, Kid Romeo really getting over as a heel here. Uh, Romeo and Skipper really taking it to Kidman until Kidman nails a sit-out powerbomb. Shooting star press Kidman Kazi from the top to the floor. On to Skipper and Romeo and the crowd again, just boom, rah, like that. And if the opening was the Dark Horse match of the night, this match here is match of the night for sure. Like, this is just an amazing, just wow, and a, a preview of what this new WCW would have been. And it's just probably the, this and the final match, the, the rematch, uh, you know, about a week later on the final Nitro is... A look at what it would have been like and you know it just you know it whets the appetite it's incredible and now time for the finish of the match as ray goes for a mid-rope moonsault but romeo catches him uh and nails his version of uh, misawa's emerald fusion yeah a one two three and romeo and skipper are the new cruiserweight tag team champs uh the finisher that uh kid romeo uh, was using the of course, the Emerald Fusion. Romeo called it the last kiss. Uh, you know, just uh, watch any Puro with Masawa in it from that era, and it is just a bone-breaking maneuver for sure. Uh, and, yeah, Romeo, 
skip or celebrate and they put over the WCW tag team championship or cruiserweight tag team championships as a big deal and it proved to be not quite as much of a big deal but those belts had potential those belts uh, I don't look at it uh, in the same line as a Ring of Honor pure title or, or a Impact Grand Championship where they brought them in and they were like, eh, flash in a pan type, uh, you know, belts. I think these belts actually had potential to really be something and be its own thing. We head backstage as Animal, Jeff Jarrett, Buff Bagwell, and Flair talk about their matches tonight. They were a faction leading into this pay-per-view. Ah, yes, the Magnificent Seven, which was... You know, your typical, these are the top echelon guys. Kind of a rehash of the Millionaire's Club angle from a year before, but, uh, you know, more heelish and with a maniacal Ric Flair as its figurehead. So, next contest was Sean Stasiak with Stacy Keebler taking on Bam Bam Bigelow. An undercard match put together the week before, Keebler was coming off of the infamous pregnancy angle with David Flair. Uh, a short-lived pairing with the mecca of manhood, Sean Stasiak. Yes, this was uh, very short-lived as the two of them had been put together after Super Brawl Revenge. Uh, and this was the first pay-per-view uh, with them kind of together. And this was going to be, I guess, Stasiak's kind of push into the mid-card to be a mid-card heel. They gave him Stacy Keebler as a valet and basically said... All right, so you guys are going to have the... They're trying to capture, I think, the Steve Austin Medusa vibe from 91 and 92. And it just didn't quite get there. Keebler, a vastly underrated performer, uh, in my opinion, for what she had to go through. She had some really bad creative in WCW. That pregnancy angle is one. And then uh, just basically off the top of her debut, just being the sexy secretary that would dance on top of tables <laughs> for about a year and a half or so. Uh, it wasn't until the jump to the WWE and um, about a year into her run there that we really got to see Stacy um, do some really neat stuff and kind of expand her character a little bit to you know something that by the end of her run was uh, she was a mega popular baby face uh, by the time she left the company Stasiak cuts a promo nothing special and and then uh, Bam Bam comes out and cuts the promo short uh, this is a big lumbering early 90s WWF style encounter it's nothing like I said overly special this one this is a very throwaway match just uh, key for the finish Keebler distracts Bigelow and tosses Stasiak some hairspray that she had hidden in her hair uh, allowing Sean to use it Stasiak hits the hangman's neck breaker which actually is a pretty decent finisher the way he presents it uh for the one two three and the former meet of tna in wwe gets dw at the last wcw pay-per-view uh the runtime on that one goes uh 555 the runtime for the previous match for the inaugural wcw cruiserweight tag team championship was 1346 um so matches one and two on a card the jet Kiwi encounter and the uh, Cruiserweight Tag Team Championship match. Uh, go out of your way to watch those. Those are amazing. This one, eh, skip it. You're not missing much. Head back backstage where the Cat and Miss Jones show up and uh, then another cut where we see Elix Skipper and Kid Romeo celebrate with the belts and kind of some foreshadowing during the promo. They say that, yeah, they'll give Kidman and Ray another crack at the belts just thinking that they can beat them. Well, at the final Nitro, they had that rematch, and Ray and Kidman walked out with the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. Uh, you know, and Skipper would go to TNA, kind of become, uh, you know, a leader in that tag team division with Christopher J Daniels with the Triple X uh, tag team for a while, a very influential tag team in the in the early days of uh, Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, and then kind of disappear. Uh, as the indie tape boom of the mid-2000s would uh, appear and show up and become a thing, whereas Chris Daniels would continue his ascension to uh, basically the wrestling legend that he is today. Uh, Kid Romeo? Uh, did things? Sure. And that's no knock on Kid Romeo. Just, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now that I've seen him in after... WCW at all. In fact, uh, it, I had to do some digging just to see here. 
Yeah, apparently he did some early TNA work and, uh, you know, some indiv individual independent uh, appearances, but was mostly big in Puerto Rico for the Cologne's World Wrestling Council. So uh, that would explain why um, we didn't really see much of him, you know, post WCW. But, you know, that was his one giant title reign was that one week as a WCW Cruiserweight champion. Cruiserweight tag team champion, I should say. Our next contest, Team Canada taking on Conan and Hugh Morris. Lance Storm and Mike Awesome make up this iteration of Team Canada, and this is all that was left. Uh, I think after this pay-per-view, you don't see Storm on WCW TV, and you don't see Mike Awesome on WCW TV. Uh, you see them with the invasion and going into ECW and that stuff. Actually, I think Storm showed up on the, on the final Nitro. I'm not sure if Awesome was there or not. But uh, if this isn't the end, this is close to the end. And this was billed as a number one contendership match for the WCW Tag Team sh titles. Uh, Morris hits the ring, and then Conan hits the ring for a lukewarm start to this one. Well, that answers my question then. Then, of course, uh, Team Canada then quickly retain, uh, retains control throughout this. Conan and Lance put together an amazing sequence. Uh, Lucha pacing, too much to call fantastic. The crowd really got into this. Morrison awesome, not so much, but uh, still serviceable with K-Dog getting the brunt of the punishment in the ring. Uh, Morris goes for the no laughing matter, but awesome intercepts, going for the running awesome bomb and gets the pin. And 1-2-3, we got new number one contenders, which is Team Canada, Awesome, and Storm. And actually, they would be paired for that. Why well, I said that answered my question, then yes. Uh, they were the team that would take on the WCW Tag Champions on the final night of Monday Nitro. Uh, who those people will be, we'll talk about a little later on down the card. But on the final Nitro, uh, Storm and Awesome would have a Tag Team Championship match. And then we wouldn't see them until... Uh, July of 2001, where they make the jump into WWF as, um, well, we would see Lance Storm sitting in the skybox at WrestleMania X7, but, uh, you know, you see both of them uh, as part of uh, the ECW invasion of WCW, or was it the WCW invasion first, and then they revealed that they were ECW guys, and then the merger happened, and it was the Alliance, so... Yeah, confusing times all around. 2001 is crazy. Not as crazy as 2020 is already, but 2001 in the wrestling scene was uh, a little bit wacko. We didn't head backstage again for the Rhodes family dressing room. Yes, uh, Dustin and Dusty were getting ready for a tag team match on this card. Uh, and Dusty hits up uh, 240 burritos. There's physically a guy that brings 240 burritos to Dusty Rhodes, and uh, and Dusty's overjoyed at this. Uh, it is a, a kiss my ass match with Jeff Jarrett and Ric Flair later on in the evening, and potty humor, of course, was in because it's early 2000s wrestling. So, Buff Bagwell and Rick Steiner uh, chat in the dressing room, and Steiner, who's this again, is more that Magnificent Seven faction, uh, you know, kind of developing storylines through this pay-per-view tonight and Steiner says that he will handle Booker T tonight for the U.S. title. Uh, Steiner is the U.S. champion going into this pay-per-view. So we didn't flip to the dressing room of the WCW Tag Team Champions, Sean O'Hara and Chuck Palumbo, and they state that tonight Bagwell and Luger are going down. Yes, the team of Totally Buff. Yes, the tag team of Totally Buff, the total package Lex Luger with the God music and <laughs> Buff Bagwell with the Buff Daddy music. Uh, basically being arrogant heels, and yes, they are part of that Magnificent Seven faction. Uh, man, things were going downhill fast for WCW at that point. WCW Cruiserweight title on the line, Sugar Shane Helms versus Chavo Guerrero Jr. Helms has the hottest finisher in wrestling at the time, uh, of this pay-per-view to Vertebraker and Chavo channeling his Uncle Eddie a bit with this heel persona. And he's a champ going into this pay-per-view. Uh, it's a technical wrestling clinic to begin. And it continues with Chavo throwing some great suplexes. Uh, the Cruiserweights have brought it on this card. Yes, if you like Cruiserweight wrestling, the Cruiserweight matches on this card over-deliver. They are amazing matches. 
Chavo gets two out of the Falcon Arrow. Nobody kicks out of the Falcon Arrow. Well, sorry, Excalibur. In this case, they do. Uh, Chavo goes for the Tornado DDT, but Shane counters into the Nightmare on Helm Street, which is basically Big Show's final cut. Uh, only two for that. Uh, the crowd chants boring here. This is a great match. I don't understand why, but again, this is early 2000. This is an early 2000s wrestling crowd. And I don't think they were so much wrestling centric as they were sports entertainment centric at that point. So, so the finish of the match, both men are fighting for a vertebraker attempt, and Helms finally grabs it almost out of nowhere, almost like an RKO out of nowhere. Uh, one, two, three, and a new cruiserweight champ. It is Sugar Shane Helms. And uh, he's got the, uh, what were they called, the Sugar Babes or something? Basically, four of the Nitro Girls dressed up in b-boy gear <laughs> at the time. And they do a little dance to the Vertebraker rap song that he had. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he was over. Uh, he definitely had a finishing maneuver that was super over. Uh, just that move got banned big time by WWE, uh, you know, as soon as the influx of WCW talent showed up. So it's just that that move got banned big time uh, when everybody jumped over to WWE. So, and it's obvious why. If you see how the Vertebraker is performed, uh, if you leave a guy unprotected in that, it could be some serious damage done. So we go backstage where Ric Flair says he's not kissing anyone's ass tonight. Uh, he flares out in a Hawaiian shirt, of all things, which, you know, if you see Flair, Ric flaring out, you know what that means. So, uh, then another quick cut. Again, there's no backstage interviews uh, in for this pay-per-view. It's just uh, quick cuts to pre-tape kind of on cameras. Uh, which I found very interesting. It kind of tells me that WCW was working with a skeleton crew putting the show together at this time. And I, I think they probably knew that, okay, there's, this is a time of transition. Something's going to happen here. And they were probably banking on the fusion to money at that point. But with the deal going by the wayside because of no television time on the Turner Networks, uh, of course, that leaves the company uh, you know, fairly inexpensive for Vince to pick up. So... But Booker T says, save the drama for your mama. Rick Steiner is the U.S. champ, and Booker T wants the belt. Uh, that's coming up later on. The World Tag Team title match is up next, but first we've got to review a couple of times that uh, showed up here uh, for the number one contendership match for the tag team belts. Uh, team Canada defeating Hugh Morris and Conan. That was 11-28. And the singles match for the WCW Cruiserweight Championship, uh, Shane Helms defeating Chavo Guerrero Jr. is 13-57. Now, the natural-born thrillers of Palumbo and O'Hare are mega faces at this time. They have uh, kind of captured the imagination of WCW's audience and again young guys doing young guy things in the ring kind of sticking it to the old guard taking on totally buffed buff Bagwell and Lex Luger and it's a walkover um this is Lex's final WCW pay-per-view appearance of course both are complete heat magnets uh, they claim that they ended Bill Goldberg's career. Well, that's storyline. That's what they have you to say when, in reality, Goldberg had walked out. <laughs> He's, he, he ain't working there no more. He's still getting paid there, but he ain't working there no more. Uh, the match starts hot with Palumbo and O'Hare hitting the ring, and then it's quick. Two Shanton bombs, his version of the Swanton, on Luger, and the champs retain... Uh, the Young Guns retain the belts, the, uh, the Natural Born Frillers, uh, Plumbo and O'Hare retain the WCW Tag Team titles in 54 seconds, um, which is a Road Warrior-esque type squash job, and these guys are built as monsters throughout this, so I don't know if this was... It, it probably was initially planned because the promo that Buff and Luger cut prior to the match itself is about four or five minutes in ring to really just uh, get the crowd really into the, their persona and just really booing them and, and getting the heat. But um, just they really got blitzed in this match <laughs> and the young guys just walk out with the belts. I laughed, but... Yeah, they were totally positioning these guys to be kind of the powerhouse tag team champions of the rebooted WCW coming up in May. So, 
Backstage, Scott Steiner cuts a promo on Paige, and it is glorious. I can't understand half of what he's saying, but he's with Medeja. They're sitting in the locker room, and the man who was the OG Tiger King, <laughs> uh, Scott Steiner, uh, man, he is glorious when he's cutting a promo, and it is an incredible promo. Check this one out on this show it is it's not steiner math good but it's one of his greatest hits definitely then we cut back to bagwell and luger and they're still laid out in the ring uh they were helped to the back uh, i guess uh just selling the after effects of being squashed uh you know a little bit more doing the favors on the way out and uh the crowd giving luger the na 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 hey 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 goodbye chant obviously they knew that luger was on the way out uh they didn't know that the entire company was on the way out at that point but uh you know soon that would be revealed uh almost as soon as the next night maybe on thunder on that first day so Next contest, Chris Canyon taking on the cat Ernest Miller with Miss Jones. Canyon with a muddy entrance with a Danzig-esque leather jacket. I love that he kind of comes up from underneath the ring and uh, you hear the who better than Canyon right into like a really metal-esque rock track. And yeah, it, it was awesome. Uh, the match starts hot as Canyon looks to attack Miss Jones again. They had a storyline going on where Canyon was just infatuated with Miss Jones. Almost uh, almost DDP stalker-ish to The Undertaker, which would take place later on that year. But um, this was, you know, kind of subtle, more subtle, I guess. Uh, not as blatant, not as obvious. Canyon sporting a cast as he broke his hand against M.I. Smooth on Monday night, so Canyon's working hurt in this match. Uh, Canyon is infatuated with Miss Jones, but the cat is keeping Canyon at bay early here. The crowd is hot for this one because the cat is a huge... Ernest Miller was huge at this time in WCW. A two count after the James Brown elbow by the cat. Uh, Canyon gets a free count, but his feet are on the ropes. The ref cancels it, and the crowd really pops off of this. Uh, you know, Cat's finisher, the feliner, he hits that, only a two count, Can Canyon hits the cap to cast, only two, but then Canyon hits the ref with the cast, Miss Jones comes in, but the Cat, but ends up, uh, hitting the Cat with the karate kick, uh, the Cat was holding Canyon kind of back with the arms like this, like saying, you know, hit him, hit him, the crowd popping, and then all of a sudden just the crowd dies, great spot, uh, she hits the second kick, though, allowing the cat to hit another feliner for the one 2 free. And the time of the fall ends up being 10 minutes and 31 seconds. Decent match. Good TV match. Post-match, though, Canyon hits Cat with Cat's finisher to feliner. And M.I. Smooth hits the ring and cleans house to a moderate pop. So, obviously, something that uh, I would think had built up here to, you know, maybe the next night on... Nitro or maybe later on on Thunder. I haven't watched those two shows in a while. Uh, we'll have to go back and take a look at it because I know that uh, M.I. Smooth I don't think is part of the final Nitro. Backstage Buff and Lex come to words after their loss and then Dusty Rhodes to the camera says it's going to get smell -a vision tonight. Well yeah he's been eating burritos so <laughs> the US title is up next. We got Rick Steiner versus Booker T. Video package hype and then Steiner taking it to Booker early. The crowd is super hot for this one. Uh, Booker fights back and axe kick into a spinner Rooney. You know classic Booker. The ref gets struck by Steiner and then all of a sudden Shane Douglas jumps out of the crowd. Uh, hits Rick Steiner from behind with a cast. They kind of launched into a feud. I don't think they had time to really finish this feud. Uh, and Booker hits the bookend for the 1-2-3. U.S. champion, Booker T. And uh, this is a huge career-making run for Booker here, as over a week later, um, he beats Rick Steiner on this pay-per-view. And then a week later, he beats Scott for the WCW title. And he, he ends up headlining... The first Monday Night Raw he's on as a wrestler, um, you know, in a match, they bring him in as, as as one of Shane McMahon's cronies in the whole WCW invasion thing. Uh, but the main event segment of Monday Night Raw in, I think, what was it, late July 2001 when they did this, uh, against Buff Bagwell for the WCW title. And this was the uh, ill-fated, I guess, quote-unquote, WWF, uh, WCW Nitro pilot. Uh, that they had uh, Scott Hudson and Arn Anderson out to make the play-by-play -play and the 
color commentary for, which I really liked. I, I liked that tandem, and I thought that they worked really well. Uh, Buff Bagwell and Booker T have a decent match for what, what it was, a TV match for the WCW title. Booker T retains, and then Bagwell tries to buddy up with Steve Austin and Kurt Angle in the back, and then the Angle goes down where Austin and Angle beat the hell out of Bagwell, grab him and his bag, and send him out the back door, and that's the end of Buff Bagwell's WWF run. You know, see ya later, because, uh, you know, the next week he has his mom calling JR, uh, trying to get him some off time. Legit, that's what happened. I am not making that up. Go listen to JR's podcast. The next contest was the Kiss My Ass match. It was Nature Boy Ric Flair, uh, Hawaiian shirt and khakis and all, taking on Dusty and Dustin Rhodes. It's a Vince Russo classic, uh, even though he's gone by this point. Uh, Flair was an on-screen power figure, CEO, you know, the big uh, leader of the Magnificent Seven. Uh, and this is the first time that Dusty and Rick, this is something that I couldn't believe, but this is the first time that Dusty and Rick were head-to-head -head on a pay-per-view. That's an unreal stat. The pop for Dusty, because they are in Florida, is huge. Uh, Flair says he's not wrestling. Uh, Jared is going two-on-one -on -one against the Rhodes boys, but fairly decent one-on-one -on -one to start between Dustin and Jeff. Uh, Dustin, though, grabs Flair and pulls him right back into the match, and... Uh, the crowd eventually pops huge when Dusty tags in, and it is Dusty and Flair one-on-one, -on -one, and Flair, even with the Hawaiian shirt and the khakis, goes to the ropes and hits it, and then Dusty cocks the elbow like that. Ah, oh, awesome stuff. Um, Flair hits Dustin with a low blow. Jarrett jumps Dustin at a different point in the match that gets the Magnificent Seven side back on top uh we should mention that animal had been barred from ringside he was going to be in the corner of uh jarrett and flair but the ref sees that early and he's a non-factor right off the bat he said no that's can't do that jarrett locks dustin in the figure four uh, dustin finally tags in dusty that's a huge pop and an atomic elbow by dusty only for two and a double figure four attempt doesn't work for the heels but right off of that dustin rolls up flair one, two, three, and the Rhodes boys win, and Flair flares out in the ring. <laughs> uh, 9.58 for a run time, so just under 10 minutes. It's probably what they had time for. It was 10 minutes. And uh, post-match, a stink face by Rhodes on Jarrett, and this is a raucous affair. Um, you know, so this was, you know, just an incredible... F and in the, the pomp and pageantry, uh, within a week, you know, and this was probably, Flair probably felt that he would never set foot in a big-time promotional uh, promotions uh, ring again at that time. Because within a week, he goes and faces Sting on the final Nitro, and then that's it. And so that's two of Flair's uh, lifelong rivals, two of the guys that he made tons of money with. Uh, you know, for one last hurrah type matches. You know, Dusty in a tag match in Florida, of all things. And then Sting in Panama City Beach, Florida. For the final nitro but then the night after survivor series comes along and uh he's the benefactor that uh or the consortium i should say the consortium was me woo and we get one of the best runs of flair's career starting with his run in the wwf in november 2001 so uh, which is his last run and it was it was a fairly lengthy run uh with it culminating at uh, WrestleMania 24 in 2008, yes, 2008 in Orlando with a farewell match against Shawn Michaels. So, the main event, the World Heavyweight Title, Diamond Dallas Page taking on Scott Steiner in a False Count Anywhere contest. Michael Buffer with the intro, DDP with a huge pop at Pyro. Steiner benefiting from the fact that Kevin Nash and Goldberg had left WCW. Sting was hurt, and Sid Vicious' uh, in-ring career is basically over. So the main event scene of WCW is basically in tatters at this point. And so th these are the guys that are left. Hot start, they fight into the crowd, and Steiner takes a pair of crutches away from a kid uh, that uh, was watching a match in a DDP shirt and whacks DDP over the head with the crutches. Uh, DDP splash through the table, though, and uh, Steiner uh, is down for the pin count, but only a two count. Uh, Steiner pie faces a pre-WWE Paul London. So we've seen a, uh, a future superstars uh 
appearance there as he's dressed in a Diamond Dallas Page t-shirt ringside and uh, on his way back to the ring they just basically told him to take a bump for the guy and so he bumps out uh, you know I popped when I saw Paul London's on this pay-per-view check that out uh, both men are busted open a belly-to-belly -belly suplex by Steiner only two a diamond cutter attempt forwarded but Page hits the second try Rick Steiner pulls the ref out though uh, anyways, with the ref out, Steiner hits Page with the belt, but again, only two. A bleeding heavily DDP, though, gets caught up in the Steiner recliner, but he fights out. But Medeja, of course, distracts the ref. Steiner hits DDP with the steel pipe across the ribs. Steiner recliner for the submission victory and post-match. A University of Michigan flag is draped over DDP, and Steiner continues to beat Page, as I look around because my mic's in the way here, uh, to beat Page with a pipe. Uh, they go into a recap video and they preview Nitro for the next night and then they get out at 2 hours and 52 minutes 22 seconds of runtime on the network my ranking for this show out of 10 is actually fairly decent I, I put it at a 7.5 out of 10 just because those three cruiserweight matches are amazing and are worth the watch even today uh, they hold up to today's status too they are great watches the natural born filler squash over totally buffed uh is totally necessary um if you believe the the mindset that was going to be in and after the show that this would be the last pay-per-view for a while and that they would come back in may with a whole bunch of new talent uh, you want to keep it fresh in their minds and have the tape of this to show for then uh you know so on and so forth uh you know and it's, it is melancholy this is the last time on pay-per-view that you see uh people for a while at least like uh diamond dallas page like a scott steiner like a um, you know, this isn't counting the final Nitro, but just on a on a big event pay-per-view basis. Uh, you know, definitely last time on pay-per-view for Lex Luger, uh, Buff Bagwell. Uh, you know, just these guys are just WCW stalwarts at this point. You know, and their and their upper echelon uh, main event talent, uh, Jeff Jarrett, Ric Flair. You know, on and on and on. So, um, you know, it's. I was watching this, and another weird parallel too is this really feels like an NXT event almost. Just due to the fact that the young guys are, are bringing down a house in matches and that stuff, and the young guys like in the tag team match and that stuff are really are, are, are getting put over by some of the older journeyman talent here and that stuff. And then, you know, you have you know, two guys who at that time, you know, Steiner and DDP in 2001, they're, they were the big superstars of the WCW. They were, you know guys at my junior high and high school that were huge fans of Scott Steiner, you know, and I was a DDP fan. So this was a main event that was talked about for a while, you know, it's just, you know, what would happen, right? So um, this was uh, quite, the, quite the look back. And so uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking with this. I know this was lengthy, but if you sat through this, awesome. Put your comments below. WCW Greed 2001. But anyways, I'm Callum Nitro, later days. Happy wrestling watching, and we'll catch you next time on Nitro Maniac TV's of Wrestling Unlimited.